RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Iron Debate, the show that settles the score. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the beginning of our 2022 road to the Olympia. We are so glad you can join us over the course of the next three, three and a half weeks. Uh, we are going to be covering all aspects of the Olympia, breaking down competitors. Of course, we are lining up athlete interviews as we go. We expect a couple to be dropped tomorrow as well. We're in talks right now with Samson Dauda, uh, Urs Kalasinski. We're going to have Milos Sarsev on later in the week to provide his perspective. But without further ado, we introduce our esteemed panel, a panel that we're very excited to get on. We've been chasing them for quite some time. We finally got them on the show. The first from Phoenix, Arizona, the 2022 Mr. USA. They call him Beef Stu, Stu Sutherland. Stu, thank you for joining. Hey, Stu. Howdy. Good to be here. Thank you for having me, guys. And then we go to Dallas, Texas, and meet the 2020, no, rather 2011 Mr. USA five-time IFBB Pro champion, Steve Kuklo. Steve, we are pleased to have you aboard and await your perspectives on everything Olympia. So thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And then, of course, we go to our Cape Coral Studios and welcome the man with the final word on all topics, Dave Palumbo. Dave, I know you've been excited for this one for quite some time. I thought you were going to introduce the Red Hulk, actually, but um, I guess I'll do the, do the honors. I can't see you right now. I can see Steve in the uh, stew. Oh, there we go. Now I got you. Uh, all right. You got me. Yeah, right. you know, so, yeah, the, the Red Hulk doesn't love well. Olympia predictions, Olympia analysis. Uh, this is probably one of the deepest lineups, minus Steve Kubo, yeah. of course, that we've had in, in a long time. And so... I think people are excited because, you know, the, this, the year was a lot longer this year, so there were more qualification spots available. And I think that was uh, really uh, why everyone is, is so up in, you know, who's going to win? You know, who's going to place top six? Because we got new names, new faces. And that's why I really wanted a fresh perspective from people who actually compete to see how they feel that these guys are going to line up. So let's get right into that. And Dave touched on it perfectly. And this is... Uh, really, in the historical perspective of the Olympia, truly one of the deepest lineups. I mean, when you look at the depth of the lineup right now, you, you know, previous year's conversations would be, all right, you kind of have an earmark who's going to finish in the top six, top seven, top eight. There's going to be a very crowded line for that top eight and top ten. Uh, Steve Kukul, let's go to you first. Just when you assess this lineup, and Dave said again with the expanded timeline, allowing for some more entry and truly some more quality into this lineup, your first perspective on this deep lineup. It, like Dave said, it, it's super deep. I'm looking at it right now, and, and uh, you know, there's a few few rookies on the list that are either first time, um, but if you look at what the top 10 potentially could be, I'd hate to be a judge at the show yeah. just because of, um, I mean, that's where the judging aspect of the sport because you're going to have preference on on what uh, physiques you like. I mean, what I like, Dave may think a little differently, and and you know, Stu might think a little differently. But you know, looking at the Olympia website and they got the top five guys who they believe will be on there. You know, it, it, that's a little. Uh, I think that's jumping the gun a little bit on on Olympia's part when you kind of go ahead and advertise the top guys. <laughs> like you got 20 guys competing. Let's put 20 on the poster and make it a make it a fair shake. And I think. Um, I think it's going to be a hell of a show, and it's going to be one of those who whoever out edges the the other guy by a fraction of a percent. It's going to be like the Roden and Phil kind of, you know, back and forth. It's so close. One guy likes Phil, one guy likes Roden, kind of thing. Stu, let's go to you because you know one of the themes really for the course of the last two to three years now has been that bodybuilding has seen sort of a steady changing of the guards. Right for about upwards of five to six years, you could pencil in who you figured was going to be in that top six, top seven. That no longer is the case. You have new faces there, and obviously you yourself aspire to be uh, amongst that group in short order. But when you look at, you know, when, whenever we preview the Olympia, we always kind of go on this perspective that everyone is going to come in on, right? And when you have such a deep lineup, such quality, you imagine a couple of guys are going to be off here and there. Um, there's going to be a lot of parity. Uh, your take on what we're going to see in a couple of weeks. Well, like Steve already said, I think there's there's something like 30 guys qualified right now, which is nuts. I think it's probably the biggest show. I, I think somebody said it was like the biggest show in history for the Olympia um, as far as head count, let alone the other divisions, you know, classic, men's, God knows how many guys they got. But um, 
a lot you're talking about like new faces and you know some rookies at the olympia they have a lot of hype around them guys like um you know andrew andrew jack, andrew jack yeah. uh, blessing comes to mind Crizo, if he does end up doing it i'm not really sure if he is doing it but um those are kind of physiques that have they, they don't really fit into a box you know andrew is like very tall he's got really long limbs very impressive um and the same thing's got to be said about blessing. There, you can't really pigeonhole these guys, though. You're talking about, like, you know, the same top six, top seven guys. They were all pretty similar proportionally and stuff. And there's some wackier looking, you know, or just, like, outside of the box kind of physiques that we're going to get to see this year. Um, and, again, like Steve said, <laughs> I would not want to judge this. I mean, you're going to have, you know, ten people in last place that are some of the best guys in the world, which is crazy to think about, but I'm looking forward to it. So, you know, we mentioned uh, Andrew Jack and Steve, you just got a close up view of him just uh, two, three months ago, your initial impression of what you saw out of someone that again, when he qualified for the Olympia, there were immediate conversations of whether he could crash that top six party in his rookie campaign. I think he can. I think he's got the the size, the shape, uh, the structure to do it. Um, I think if he nails his conditioning, he can be very, he can be a, a very legitimate threat. Um, you know, I'm one of the bigger frame guys on, on that stage. You, yeah. you know, I'm six foot myself and, you know, Andrew is probably a little taller than I am. And I mean, he just had some gnarly, the gnarly body parts, but he flowed really pretty too. Small waist, big quads, big back, you know, it's, it's the things that make a, a you know, it kind of pop to a judge. So I, I think Andrew's definitely a contender in there. Uh, Dave, I wanted to bring you because Stu brought up a really good point, and that is sort of, sort of a point that I was going to go towards later on, and that is, you know, perhaps chasing that size game. And, and that is, with some of these, these new faces, these new physiques that we have, they may not fit necessarily into one or two categories. You might have some unique shapes introduced into the mix this year. You know, I, I was discussing this with Chris on the show, and, and, and I think him and I both feel the same way. You know, when you look at Andrew Jack by itself, and I, and, and I take Steve's um, um, opinion, like, really seriously, because, you know, he competes with these guys, and he's seen them up close. I, have, I haven't seen Andrew compete in person, so I, I haven't really gotten a, a true perspective on him. But I always go back to, like, all right, this guy is great. He's got this set of tools. But then I start saying, can he beat Hottie Shupin? Well, probably not. Can he beat William Bonac? Well, probably not. Can he beat Nick Walker? Well, Nick's kind of freaky, you know, and crazy conditioning. Probably not. So I start, in my mind, starting out like, yeah, this guy's top six. And then I say, wait a second, can he really beat those? In other words, I think what happens is we devalue the top six guys and don't realize how hard it is to get to that top six, era. So if you make it into the top six at the Olympia, you're freaking good. And you've got gifts beyond just size, beyond conditioning. It's a shape, structure, everything. So I, I really value those guys. The only way you get kicked out of that top six is if your physique starts falling off. And that could be due to age. Some of these guys get older and they, and they start losing a little bit. Or they have an injury or something. Or, or they just come in out of shape. And that, those are the only reasons you really get kicked out of that top six. You know? So for a guy like Andrew Jack or you know a guy like Blessing to, to break into that top six is even or Crizo, it's going to be tough you know to to by themselves winning shows they look amazing but how will they look against the best in the world? I think that we're going to get a different perspective and they're not going to be so amazing. Although I will say all three of those guys I mentioned I think have great future potential and I think they will be in that top six at some point. I just personally don't think it's going to be this year. Could be wrong, but. That's just me. Yeah, yeah and a few other names that, you know, uh, obvious for obvious reasons, where they finished last year, like an Ian Valliere, uh, prime candidate, Akeem Williams, a couple of years ago in that top six prime candidate. But they, they have some wild cards, right? And again, we talk about different shapes, uh, structures that you're going to see on that Olympia stage. And that is the introduction of Derek Lunsford now to the open class. And uh, Stu, I'll go to you first in this one because, you know, if you listen to Chris Aceto, and for his justification as far as how shows are judged nowadays and, you know, again, how much of a priority, how much of an emphasis put on conditioning, on shape, on pure shape. Someone like a Derek Lunsford, in his word, will come in and destroy this lineup. That's what he said a couple of instances on Heavy Muscle Radio. How do you see Derek Lunsford fitting into this open class? Well, if you think it like, think about like all the 
boxes you got to check as a bodybuilder, like uh, structure and shape, conditioning, balance, symmetry. He's basically got all of that, and he's also like one of the best in the world at all of that. His problem is he's five foot six, you know, and Rami's like five ten, five eleven, and just like twice as wide as him. Um, and standing on his own, Derek is like a world beater. We all saw him in, in Pittsburgh, and he doesn't look like he's lost any of that size because he's not sucking down to two twelve this year. But I think I think he could be as high as like top three, honestly. Because, you know, Chris Aceto also, also likes to say it's a glutes and ham show, and he's got glutes and ham. <laughs> you know, he's dug out back there. You know he doesn't miss because Hani's running the show. Um, and, yeah, I mean, besides the overall structural, like, height and width, he's got all the boxes checked. Um, Steve, I'm sorry. Hey, go on. I thought you were done. Go on. Yeah, go on, please. Yeah, he's, he's just a little smaller than all those guys. I don't think getting bigger would help him necessarily. Um, it's just, you know, Randy's so goddamn huge. <laughs> so, well, so Steve, I, you know, you're the perfect, uh, I guess, um, example of this because I, you know, I, I wanted to bring up a, a larger point in all this. And that is when you can consider the 212 class and how it used to be sort of a standalone entity, but then say circa 2015, 2016, there started to be that discussion, right? Like how would, how would Flex Lewis do in the open? You know, uh, what would that look like? I mean, obviously, he's got the shape, but would he be able to stand in against just bigger bodies, bigger physiques? And then you look at someone like yourself, you know, six foot two, and you are going to have some taller competitors. You just mentioned, you know, Rami standing at about five, nine and a half, five, ten. Lunsford's got all the bells and whistles. He's got the structure. And now, obviously, he's not going to have to suck down. He's not going to have to restrict his body. But yes, height might come into play. And judges, it's, it's again, it's a subjective sport. How do you think Derek Lunsford fits in in his first Mr. Olympia uh, in the open class? I'm a big fan of his physique, no doubt. I think what Stu said was right on. I mean, he's got all the bells and whistles to, you know, he obviously won to 212 Mr. Olympia. So he, he's he got a world-class physique. Um, he, his disadvantage is his height. You know, you, if he's 240 on stage and you got Big Rami that's 290 and you got some other guy, Samson's 290, you know, I usually compete around 280. There's big bodies on that stage. And if say if, if you have a top five and you have Lunksford and you have all, all everybody else is 270 plus, he's going to look like the one that's kind of the odd man out. But not saying that he can't hold his own against him. And um, I mean, Hottie's not very tall and Hottie, Hottie brings it. So um, I think he definitely has has a chance to be in that top six, no doubt. Dave, final word on Derek Lunsford. I mean, again, um, for years leading up to this show, you know, you had pointed out obviously that his body was better suited yeah. for the open co open class competition. That it was just not a two twelve physique, and that eventually over time that would test to be true. Now we're going to see that in the span of about three and a half weeks. Um, how do you see him stacking up against? I mean, and again, I want to say bigger, but perhaps some of the taller competitors that he's no doubt be standing next to. Yeah. He's gonna he's gonna have to talk trouble against the taller guys for sure. But I always say, well, you know, because I think Derek's probably goal is to break the top six. I mean, that would be a reasonable goal for his first time in the Open class. The question is, can he beat William Bonax? Is he better? I asked Chris Aceto that question, and Chris said no, after Chris gave him a lot of praise. So, you know, you have a William Bonac who's probably the same height as Lunsford, right? And he's got possibly more bells and whistles, more roundness, more cartoonish-looking muscle. Look... I don't know. He might beat him. He probably, he might have, you know, better gifts. We need to see these guys together. We have not seen Lunsford against these guys yet. So it's very hard to make predictions. So while my instinct tells me that Bonac can take him out still, because I think Bonac's just got, you know, been around longer, more muscle maturity. But until I see them next to each other, it, it, it's really, I'm just guessing. Uh, same thing with Hottie Schupin. Hottie Schupin was third in the world. You know, I mean, can Lunsford take him out? I don't know. You know, uh, we have to see them next to each other to really make that assessment. I like Lunsford's physique, and I think that he's got a... He really doesn't have any weaknesses uh, to his body, especially when he brings the conditioning. So it'll it'll be fun. I just don't think anyone's beating Big Rammy unless Big Rammy comes in out of shape, because I think Ram, Big Rammy's the guy who's got to beat Big Rammy. And... Brandon Curry has just got too many gifts structurally, I think, and the height to be beat. So I, I think those guys are going to be first, second, you know, and then we're going to be, then you got to deal with Nick Walker, 
What do you, yeah. how do you, how does Lunsford do against Nick Walker? I think Walker is just too much muscle for him and, and just overwhelms him. And then you got Hunter Labrada. You got, you can't forget him because he's got incredible shape and structure with the mass that he's added. And, and hopefully he brings conditioning. This last year he was, his conditioning was a little off and he was still fourth. So, I mean, now we're down to what? Fifth, sixth place we're, we're dealing with now. So the quite and then and really down to fifth and sixth you're, you're battling so it's going to be very hard to break into that top six because you have so many quality competitors up there and someone's going to be left out now the the wild card or the 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 unknown factor is who's going to come in out of shape because not everyone's going yeah. to be in shape that's just not going to happen so the question is there's going to be a couple guys booted out of there because they just don't bring the conditioning that they needed to for whatever reason, whatever happened to them, they got sick or they mistimed their peak or whatever the excuse is, there's going to be people that are not in, at their best. And that's going to give, if Lunsford is at his best, that's going to give him the ability to break into that top six. I think. So, hey, so let's talk about, let's Steve, talk about the guys. Steve, Steve wants to follow yeah. up. No, Dave, yeah, Dave, you make a really good point. And, and I think a lot of people, fans especially, um, get a little jump the gun a little bit when they see pictures from the gym or the, the magic lighting the, you know, two weeks out and people start placing placings just based on gym pictures i mean lunsford by himself is a freak he, he looks like a cartoon you put him on stage with the big boys it, it's a different you know that's that's kind of i'm opposite of that like i see myself in gym pics and I, everybody's kind of like ah steve don't look that good and get on stage you're like well shit, he's he's huge like yeah. so it, there's that illusion of bodybuilding yes right. but I think as soon as you get on stage, that's going to be the real test for these guys to see, you know, where they stand. You got your proven guys, which is, you know, the top six that have, have shown up the last several years. But it's the guys like the Andrew Jack, the Lunsfords. Those are the ones that, hey, could they slide in? If somebody's a little bit off, misses their peak, that's that's the big question. Instagram is the great, is the great equilibrator. It, it, it makes everyone equal in height, in, in weight. Because on that little you cube, can't hide the flaws. everyone looks the same size, right? Uh, there's, there's no filter or Photoshop <laughs> right. on stage. <laughs> oh, this is the part where, like, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to be posting progress pictures. And you'll always have Lee Priest, you know, in the comments, like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whatever he just comes on show day. But, but let, let's talk about, I mean, again, like Dave said, and, and it very, may, very well may uh, be true again this year where, you know, we're, we're projecting based off, obviously, what happened last year and based off, yes, whatever it is that we have to go by, pictures on Instagram and so on and so forth. So it, whatever happens on show day, we may all be proven to be wrong. But just basing this conversation at least off what we, t- we saw from last year and the starting with Rami, because, you know, with Rami, it's funny because now, you now the two of the conversation is, oh, he looks simply unbeatable. And you know, it, it's almost to the point of like three years ago, rather two years ago with his first title when Phil made his comeback, you know, we were all sitting here going, you know, Phil brings it, there's no one beating him, no one beating him, no one beating him. And, and he almost got to the point where when you finally saw him, you realize, oh, it's he's human. Oh, my God. So if I maybe from a Jigs perspective, but let's just talk about, Steve, I'll go to you first in this one. Um, because when you look back at the journey it has been for Robbie, right, obviously broke onto the scene in 2013 and then just shrouded in mystery, right? And we always – He's wondered whether or not he was ever going to scratch that potential that he had. Um, and two years ago, not qualifying for the Olympia, getting the special invite, which drew some controversy in and of itself. But then, you know, the uh, iconic quote now, winter is coming, that he said in the press conference, and then, of course, going on to win and in dominant fashion. Last year, however, uh, after prejudging, many said that Brandon may have come out in front, came in better Saturday night, did what he had to do to win. Then this year, again, the story was more so, well, he's not doing enough as an ambassador to the sport. He's not doing enough, and obviously missing the uh, guest posing at the uh, in Pittsburgh. But then, over the course of the last couple of months, something has totally changed. Posting more pictures, videos of himself, and and I mean, really putting himself out there in a way we've never seen before. What do you make of this little odyssey that has been with Big Rami at the top of the bodybuilding world? I think it's that freak factor that he brings. It's it's um, you know it's not that he's a you know necessarily personality. Like Phil had a lot more personality that, you know, was controversial that people liked and created back and forth. But I think the it's the freak factor with Rami. It's something like the Ronnie Coleman. It's something you see once a decade or once in the in the lifetime of bodybuilding, some a physique that size and that that big. Um, but like you said, I mean, there's guys I, I think I think Brandon Curry and I think 
Nick Walker, all give give him a run. I think they have better shapes. There's some better. You know, Curry's got a better shape. It flows better. So it's really going to be what those judges want to see. Being Mr. Olympia to me always gave you a little a little kind of jump on the competition going into the show because you know he's the guy they have to beat. You know, and and that's um, I think that plays in his advantage for sure. Uh, Stu, based on what you saw out of Rami in his first title win in uh, 2020, and then obviously last year, to what you're seeing now, your assessment of physique and in terms of how he's grown as a champion, and then if you had to project, you know, what we see out of Big Rami in three and a half weeks. I, I don't think anyone's touching him, to be honest. I, I've heard that from a lot of other people, too. I think two years ago, or excuse me, three years ago when he one for the first time. Um, he was finally good enough in conditioning. He's always been big. He's always been pretty proportioned, you know, wide and all that stuff. Um, but he was finally good enough conditioning wise to, you know, get the nod. Um, I think if he continues to be good enough or gets a little bit harder, no one's touching him because like he's a, you know, in a lot of the categories that you're looking at, you know, conditioning, he's like an eight you know, symmetry and proportion. He's like a seven or an eight. He's all, he's very good in all those categories. And then like overall size and structure, he's like an 11 out of 10. So, you know, no one's, and I think that's why he, he's so dominant right now. Like I, he's, he's good enough in a lot of areas, um, but it's bodybuilding, you know, he's the biggest guy and he's good enough in these other departments. So, uh, and like Steve said, it, it's going to be tough to be thrown him. So, Dave, again, we tease the fact that with Rami, the story's always been sort of the inconsistencies, right? Obviously, going gym to gym, country to country, coach to coach. But over the course of the last two, two and a half years now, uh, really seemed to have settled in, has hit a formula with uh, Chad Nichols. And then, you know, uh, obviously, we all had some fun with the panic mode with Dennis James. Uh, but what have you seen in, in, in terms of this evolution of a champion of big Rami? And, and based off what you have seen, Again, it's tough to really project based off project progress pictures. What do you expect to see in three, three and a half weeks out of Rami? Well, first of all, you have to, I mean, if you think about Dorian Yates, you know, back in the day, Dorian was very inaccessible too. You know, his, the guy never showed up. I mean, he was, he would just come to like guest posings and stuff like that. And, and then he would disappear. And so he wasn't like a personable Mr. Olympia. So the fact that Rami kind of doesn't really, you know, you don't really see him except around Olympia time. You know, really shouldn't you know shock you. That's just his personality. I think uh, the difference between him and Dorian was that Dorian was very self motivated. Like he would never miss a workout, a meal, nothing. Like he was analytical about everything, and so he was in his own little world. Rami is a little different. Rami can get easily distracted. I feel, and I think that's why that we're seeing inconsistencies since. Dennis has been the guy who's been basically watching over Rami the last, you know, whatever, six, eight weeks or whatever. Th this time it was almost 12 weeks, I think. I think that rami has been more on track. Like, Rami almost needs that. Like, he can wander around and do his thing in the offseason, but when the contest prep comes on, he almost needs another person there with him, you know, eating with him, training with him, just keeping him in, in, on track. Because when he's on track... We know genetically he no one can beat him. He's like he's like King Kong, this guy. I mean, I mean, he's just he's so much bigger than everyone else. When you look at the pictures, I, I put a picture on Heavy Muscle Radio of Nick Walker and, and Rami hitting a most muscular facing each other. And and Rami yeah, literally last year. looks like his father. I mean and, and Nick looks like a little kid. Nick is huge, you know. So Rami's that big. And 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 I wouldn't want to have to stand next to this guy. I mean, he's got width, he's got Quad size. He doesn't really have any weak body parts. His back is, you know, a little high attached. The detachments are a little high, but um, his lat spread is is out of control. I mean, so miss, the be, the most dominant Mr. Olympias have always had incredible backs and lat spreads, and from Haney to Dorian to Ronnie. And so, you know, Rami just he talking about check boxes. He checks every box that you need. The question is consistency has never been there. I want to see him change his name from Big Rami to Ripped Rami. When he becomes <laughs> Ripped Rami, where we can expect him coming in every single time, shredded, he's unbeatable. The only thing that could beat him would be an injury, like what happened to Ronnie with his back. You know, one of the lats started getting smaller because he had that that impingement in his you know. In his spine. As long as Rami's injury free, he's unbeatable. There's no one out there who could beat him. I don't care. I, you, if I take all the guys that are out there now and I add 
20 pounds of muscle to them, they still don't beat Ramy because he's just wide and big. And, and, and like Steve said and like Stu said, it's a, the Olympia is about size. It's a bodybuilding show. And so if you have size and structure and you're the reigning champ, you can't be beat. Dave, let me ask you this. What, do you think in when Rami came out at the New York Pro, was it 2013, his first show, yeah. 2014? Yeah. That, to me, was my favorite Rami package. It was clean. It was yeah. hard. Like, he nailed at that point. Yeah. And then he kind of did the Trey Brewer. We kind of fell off for a bunch of years. And then, and then, he, then he came back on, yeah. you know, and 2020 finally put it all together. So, You know, when things come too easy for someone – they tend to coast. I mean, that's, that's the, you know, the only person who doesn't coast was Ronnie Coleman. He was the only guy who had genetic gifts and he worked harder than everyone else. Very few people are like that. Most people that have genetic, it looks like, look at Flex Wheeler. He worked hard, but by his own admission, he would cheat on his diet and he, you know, he would mess up. You know, Ronnie would never cheat on his diet. You know, Dorian would never cheat on his diet. And so, you know, that's why they had such great consistency. You know, I just think that, you know, Rami, it came too easy to him, and he, he was coasting a little bit because it was, it was that easy. And, you know, everyone was saying Mr. Olympia. Meanwhile, he showed up in 13 with a great look, but he was not shredded by any means. But you know what? He had fresh muscle back then. That was when he had just really come on the scene. He had no injuries. His back was, was great. And, uh, you know, we just wanted to see him tighten up a little bit and, and then take the Olympia throne. <laughs> but he never did that because I think he didn't have that push internally to go – go after it. He had too many people advising him. He had the camel crew. He had this one. He had people calling him up, gurus telling him, I'll, I'll get you in shape. And he was listening to everyone, you know? And so he didn't have a good game plan. And, and so he had all the genetic potential to be Mr. Olympia, but he didn't have a good game plan or, you know, his work ethic maybe wasn't where it needed to be. And I think finally the last two years or three years, he just really stepped it up a little bit. And he's still not, a, he's still not where he should be, you know, you know, focus wise, but I think this is going to be the best year because I think he's older now. He's more mature. He understands the significance of, of his title and he doesn't want to lose it, obviously, because he's doing the work. And that, and I think that's a combination that's going to be hard to beat a Rami that's actually focused on what he wants. So, so let's go oh, to now. A lot of, oh, let me finish yeah. Up. yeah, go ahead. I, I, blame a, I blame a lot of that on his guidance, like his inconsistency over the years. Because he was coach hopping for the longest time, he was with the Camel Crew. They were jamming all kinds of stuff into him. You know, Chad's talked about what they've had to do with his legs, trying to open him up and make him separated again. Um, and you know, they kept on bringing him in at like 300 pounds or something, and it just that wasn't what he needed to do. The closest he ever got was when he was with Aceto, and he got down to like 270 something or 280 yeah. something. He was little ran. Medium run. Um, I think. Yeah, and, and then he finally hooked up with Chad, and Chad's for the best in the world. Um, they've got a formula. And, I, you know, I think this year, it, Chad mentioned that last year going to the Olympia, he really didn't have an offseason at all. He had, like, six or seven months before the show to train because he was – I think he might have been injured or something. But he's been training the whole offseason, and that's why he's, he looks so ginormous right now. Um, you know, because he didn't look like that at, you know – I know we're like four weeks out now, but like some of the pictures from like seven, eight weeks out that he was putting up, like he was like 340 or something. He didn't look like that last year. And he was a really lean 340. So I think, I think he's in a totally different spot. And I was, I was actually listening to, um, uh, Dusty Hanshaw's and, uh, Ron Partlow's podcast and they were over in Dubai. Uh, and they saw Rami there in the gym training because he's over there right now. And they said that he was, like, in really good spirits. You know, his state of mind seemed really good. He was at the gym talking to people. Um, and their impression of him was that he was – he hasn't been like that in the past. And he's a lot more, you know, got his head on straight and he's happy to be doing what he's doing now. So I think that bodes really well for, for where he's at. He's always been, you know, a very affable personality, very friendly, obviously. I mean, that's what anyone around him. Um, will always tell you is just that there never seemed to be a clear direction, a clear plan, a clear path. And I think that's, you know, what he's established over the course of the last two, two and a half years. And, and obviously he's paid dividends, but let's move on to the crop that again, based off last year and based off all the conversation that we've been having and whatever you want to call the, you know, extraneous factors that we figure to be his main competition, that we figure to be the biggest threats 
to him winning his third Mr. Olympia title. And the first one we'd have to mention is Brandon Curry. Brandon Curry is someone that, I mean, really, when you look back at 2017, the steady rise that he had to really becoming one of the true elites, you know, in the open class. And then, of course, winning the 2019 Olympia, you know, last year, bringing what in many people's opinion was a more balanced package, bringing up the legs. Um, but again, you know, to everyone's assessment, Saturday night, Rami came in a little tighter and just bigger bodybuilder than Brandon Curry. He did enough to retain the title. Um, it, when you look, as still, we'll go to you first. One. Brandon Curry, um, you see the tools that he possesses. Last year, a little bit more balanced. This year, again, based off progress pickers, looks to have been adding some size. And then you look at the tale of two shows in 2019, right, where he won the Olympia. 2019, maybe more of a condition package. The uh, Arnold Classic, maybe more of a fuller package. And I'm really telling us how he wanted to sort of see if he could combine that. Based off what you've seen and perhaps, again, uh, project him having added some size, uh, what does Brandon Curry have to do to put himself in the best position? Again, if Rami comes in a little bit off to put himself in position to win the, the title back. I mean, for, for one thing, I don't think I don't think Brandon gets enough talk or hype because you know he's over in Kuwait and he's not putting up a ton of pictures and he's not in a lot of people's discussions right now. Like they forgot he was second last year. He was second, right? Are yeah. You guys remembering that right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Two years in a row. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, his only weak body part is really like maybe conditioning in the glutes and hams. So Some of that's just like a skin tone thing. He's get he's so dark. Uh, it's hard to see the separation down there. And then his quads, you know, they don't sweep out like, like obviously like Rammies or even like hotties. Um, if he put muscle on in his quads, which I mean, the, the guy's in his forties now, if I'm not mistaken, you don't tend to see people get their legs bigger at that age. But if, if he put it on there, then yeah, he, I think he's, that, that's probably his best bet to dethrone Rammy. I, again, I don't think it's going to happen. You know, to be brutally honest, but because um, you know he's he's wide, he's got amazing shape, structure, all that stuff, and he's got roundness that that you know Rami doesn't have. But um, he just again, he just doesn't have the same freak factor, and you know, just overall width. He's not as wide as the barn like like Rami is, and it's it's hard to stand next to that. So, um, but yeah, I think he's he's probably a shoe in for top three easily. Steve, I think I think like Stu said, uh, Brandon's Achilles heels has always kind of been his legs. When you when you compare him to a Big Rami, to a Hottie, to Nick Walker, I mean those those guys got massive quads. Um, and Brandon's done a good job of bringing his legs up, no doubt. Um, so I, to me, Brandon's really going to have to bring something that you know we haven't seen to beat Rami. He can't bring the same package as last year and expect that he's just going to beat Rami. Because Rami, obviously, like we we just talked about last half hour, that he's bringing an improved package just from all the training and being on top of things and and you know dotting his eyes and crossing his t's. So, you know, I I think if you think about it, Brandon Curry number two. I think you know Hottie in the picture. Hottie brings that mix of size and condition, that really hard grainy branch worn type condition. Um, you know, and, and I think the Ian and, and, and Walker and Labrada kind of mix up could really, could really, you know, stir things up. And then Bonac, I believe too, is, is truly somebody that's on, is one of those dark horse. Like if he shows up insane, improved, you're like, oh boy, like this, this is a, a wrench in the thing. Well, we'll see, but I mean, let, let me ask you just about Hunter Labrada specifically, only because Again, there's debate. Some think he came in condition. Some think he left a little bit on the table last year. But again, you know, Dexter Jackson, he he, he jumped in with us on our um, uh, Olympia final wrap-up video. And, and and he said such a profound quote about Hunter Labrada. He said that, um, you know, when you look at Hall of Fame athletes, right, and obviously he's talking about his father, he's like, you generally don't get the kid being as good as the Hall of Fame parent. He said, however, in this case, you could actually see that coming to fruition. And there are many that have pegged Hunter Labrada as a potential future Mr. Olympia, someone that brings, you know, that that quality of shape. But then again, he has put on progressive size as well. You having seen him up close as much as you have. 
Yeah, you know, where do you see Hunter Le- or maybe better yet, what does Hunter LeBron need to do uh to improve on that position from last year, that, that number four position? I would agree with you that if, if he brings in a, a slightly harder package, uh, I think he's got the size. He's added more size this year just based on seeing some photos. Um, I really think that if he if he nails it, he could absolutely, you know, move somebody like Hottie out because I, I, I think I, I'm a fan of Hunter's physique. I like I like bigger body physiques, you know, and one of the things people also – don't know about maybe as fans but when you have a bigger physique you add a lot more muscle it's a little trickier to dial in the next year too because you're dealing with holding a lot more muscle you have, you have the, the fill out process or the you know the peak week stuff is a little bit different every year as you get bigger um i i, I know that from personal experience you know where it takes a lot more food but at the same time you're trying to dry out but you're pushing food so there's those factors i mean if rami's going to be over 300 it's going to be a lot of food to make sure he's full mm-hmm. and hard at that at that weight so i think i think uh, hunter could definitely be in a mix if he's a little bit sharper than last year he's gonna he's gonna you know, hurt some people's feelings uh let's go around the horn because i know we have to wrap up real quick um nick walker you know we saw the progression and obviously we saw him you know really burst onto the scene last year winning the arnold classic and then of course a, a highly impressive Olympia debut and and really so much of the conversation this year and, and to Stu's point you almost forget that Brandon Curry was second place last year and then of course Hadi Chupan has been a fixture in the elite level and let's not forget Hadi Chupan one of the biggest things about this year um as opposed to uh last year where I think he showed up what 24 hours before pre-judging this year he's you know gave himself a good six-week cushion now granted we know uh, not the easiest thing. All right, get on a plane. Obviously, the whole thing with the visa situation. Um, a lot has to go on behind the scenes. But he did get here six weeks in advance. So he gets a full six weeks with um, Hani Rambot, trained to prep to do whatever he needs to do. So, again, he is going to be a serious threat. But so much of the conversation this year in the 22, 22 bodybuilding scene has been, can Nick Walker elevate and win the Olympic? Can he knock off Big Rami? Stu, in everything you have seen out of Nick Walker's progression from becoming a pro two and a half years ago uh, to bursting onto the scene last year and to seeing the freak size he has put on. Look, he, he leaves nothing to mystery. He's putting up pictures of his physique regularly. So there's no mystery as far as what he's going to what he looks like, what he's going to show up on stage. That's to be seen. But in your opinion, I mean, again, the stars and the moon align. Can Nick Walker win the Olympia this year? This year, no. Um, and I say that because, I mean, he's, he's, I'm, I'm a fan of him. Everyone's a fan of him because he's like a bodybuilder's bodybuilder. He's yeah. been proving people wrong for like years, years and years now. Nobody even thought he would turn pro, you know, back in like 2019 when he lost the USA. Um, but I look at him now and he's, I, he's got some freaky body parts. He's got some freaky poses. His back poses are amazing. He's also very consistent. He hasn't been off conditioning wise since he's been on a pro stage, as far as I can remember. Um, but he's, he has improved his legs this year, definitely, like his sweeps. It's just, it's, he's standing next to Rami and he has, Rami has the biggest quads in the world. Um, and, you know, certain poses like his front double and front last spread, he just doesn't have like the shape and flow that, you know, somebody like even Rami or God forbid, you know, he, I don't think he can jump Brandon Curry in those departments. Um, so, yeah, I think he could sneak past people. Um, I, I think the interesting story, we were just talking about Hunter Labrada, you know, that rematch between those two, four and five last year, I think a lot of people thought maybe Nick should have jumped over him. I would kind of agree with that. Um, I think Nick is more consistent. Like we can count on him being in the top five and being hard. I think Hunter is going to be more of a wild card because, you know, like, like Steve was saying, if he's conditioned, then he can start, you know, I think he'll be in the top five again. If he's not though, I, I see him falling out because even though he does have, um, a lot of good body parts, he, he flows well, he's, he's big and he's complete. Like, he does have a couple of gaps too. You know, he's got a pretty badly torn, torn pack. Um, his waistline isn't quite as tight as it used to be. Um, there's a couple little things there that like, you know, you can pick out and start analyzing it and, you know, he could slip a few if he's not in shape. If he's in shape though, if he's like 
if he's dry and hard like he should be, then yeah, I think he's he's a shoe in the top five again. So, Dave, you can make a well. case for why Nick Walker on his, on the right circumstances can win at the Olympia this year. Because the other guys are off. Because Nick Walker's never off. If you get your Rammy's a little conditioning is off, maybe Brandon's legs are not where they need to be. Uh, Bonac doesn't peak properly, he's too flat. Hunter's off conditioning wise again. Nick Walker wins the Olympia. You know, that and that and that don't you know, we're laughing, you know, in a sense in our heads, but that could easily happen. I've seen it a million times. I've watched a lot of Olympias and, and the top guys have not been where they needed to be. And, and you know what? Someone like Dexter wins, right? 08 Olympia. I mean, there it is right there. So that could be Nick Walker for sure. But if everyone in that, some of these other names I just mentioned are on, it's gonna, Nick's going to have his work cut out from, not because he's not the biggest or, or the hardest, but because these guys have slightly better structure than him. But he's super dangerous. I would never bet against that guy because you know what? He's so consistent. I have a question just for our panelists just to, to, to wrap up the show. If... May he rest in peace. If Sean Roden was alive today and competing at the peak of his powers, does he can he beat Big Rammy? Me, no. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I, I, I don't yeah. think I don't think in this lineup Sean will make top five or six. Wow. <laughs> I, I you know, I disagree I really, because I think he's a better Brandon Curry. I think he's a Brandon Curry with legs. But that's just me. Yeah, but you know, you look at his arms. To me, his arms were weak, and he had a few. His back wasn't always, you know, as as a Brandon Curry esque. So yeah, you know, you apples for oranges. It's you know that's where the judging aspect of bodybuilding really right. plays in. And I, I'm going to agree with you, Dave, on Nick Walker. And I think Nick Walker does have a chance potentially to win if you know the stars align, kind of thing. Uh, I competed against Nick, uh, him and I at the Arnold two years ago. Yeah, and uh, he made me a believer. <laughs> he, he, you know, when I when I first saw him backstage, you know, you kind of see him, but the way he presents on stage is is something special in in his uh, his aura, his confidence, and the way he he really you know maintains his midsection really well. Uh, you know, doesn't let it come out. You know, people say oh bubble gut and whatever, but when he's on stage, he does a good job. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, because, yeah, one, one more thing I want to say. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, and I, <laughs> now I forgot what I wanted to say. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, gentlemen, wrap this up with one name. If Rami is not the 2022 Mr. Olympia, give me one name who's going to be walking away with the Sandow stew. Um, just because he has a way of proving people wrong, Nick Walker. <laughs> Steve. I like that. Nick Walker would be my name. You know, I interviewed uh, Branch a Warren a few weeks ago, and Branch Warren told me that he thought Hunter Labrada was going to win the Olympia. He saw him in person. He is that impressed with him and the improvements he's made. Um, who's to, you know, Branch has got a good eye. You know, I, I have to say that he must see something that maybe a lot of people don't, haven't seen yet because they're not in the gym with, Hunt, with Hunter, you know, live. So don't be surprised if Hunter Labrada shocks a lot of people. That's going to do for this episode of Iron Debate, our first Olympia preview segment here on the 2022 Road to the Olympia. Special thanks. Stu Sutherland, Steve Kuklo, Dave Palumbo, and of course, our producer, Tyler Shore. Tyler, back in studio, and you're going to, of course, see him live on After Hours. At least you'll hear the laugh. Thank you for joining us. Keep it locked to rxmuscle.com.